All right. So three, we're recording. two, one. Boom, we're live. We're live. Jordan Cooney. Hey. So to set the stage real quick, Jordan and I just met. We're at, we're at the Richmond Airport. Redmond. In Redmond Airport. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, in Bend, Oregon. Uh, right. We had a four-hour delay and decided to do this impromptu kind of interview conversation here at the airport. So this was a crazy ride. Anyway, um, thanks for doing this, first of all, with me, Jordan. Jordan Cooney, CEO of Search Metrics Inc. Um, give me the quick kind of load on who you are. What you're yeah, doing. sure. Um, so I'm the CEO of Search Metrics Inc. I've been at Search Metrics now for five years. I essentially manage the U.S. business. Uh, Search Metrics, as you know, Kevin, uh, started in Germany. Um, and about eight years ago, they moved into the U.S. market. And we've, me and my team, we've been expanding into the U.S. market and, and trying to grow our market share here and, and in the SEO software space. I remember that pretty well. I know. Uh, for, <laughs> for whoever doesn't know, uh, Jordan and I have been almost pretty much starting at Search metrics at the same time. Yep. And uh, you persisted. Uh, <laughs> I, I kept in, I left. <laughs> no, so it's good though. It's good. You and I go way back, man. Uh, and you're a very impressive character. Uh, Thank you. you have a Thank lot you. of interesting stories to tell. And um, unfortunately, we don't have any, any beer here or any tequila shots. I know you really <laughs> love those. But uh, we're going to go right into it. So um, you have been having a huge impact on eBay as sure. director yeah. of SEO. Is that right? Or yep. Yep. I was at, at eBay for five years prior to search metrics. Yep. Right. As director of SEO and content. And uh, eBay is an impressive startup, but also has done some impressive SEO stuff. So yeah. right off the bat, like, what was the craziest story you remember from the eBay times? Boy, oh, the craziest story from the eBay times. I think that there's a couple of them. Um, one of them, absolute craziest thing. Uh, I had this coworker, Maxime. He was really wicked smart. This guy was uh, one of the most talented people on the team. And, and he created um, an algorithm that allowed us to look at internal eBay search trends and then auto-generate the creation of a page. All right. And there was multiple things that happened in that process. Not only are we using our own internal search to like identify what topics we should build a page for, but then there's a whole creation process that took place that required um, inventory that would be sourced for the page. Uh, there was an NLP process, so we use natural language processing to literally create a description on the page. And so everything was automated. There was like literally zero human involvement. At the time, we were scaling on uh, holidays. So we would basically take a targeted holiday, we'd look at the previous year's search trends, look at what was starting for that holiday, and the beauty of the auto-generated process is that you know, typically in most of these most companies, it would take a long time to build a holiday event page. But we're literally looking at data in real time so we could instantly build this holiday page and get it to rank fast because of the domain authority on eBay, right? So what ended up happening, so cut, to cut to the chase, what ended up happening is um, some of our uh, negative keywords, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have the right amount of negative keywords because a couple of inappropriate pages made it through the system. And the press got a hold of this. And uh, the VP of PR and communications calls me up one day. This is like pre-Slack era, right? So he had like literally physically called my desk. <laughs> and he's like, uh, Jordan, I need you to come to my office immediately. We have um, all hands on deck public relations issue and your team is involved. And I'm like, oh, what, what, what did my team do? Like, how did my, my team? <laughs> I was like, I'll be right there, man. I'm, I'm coming. And so I went up and like, like there's 30 people in this like war room like crisis mode, people are like sweating and just like, and they're like explaining to me that like the New York Times is about to publish this article about these pages that are inappropriate and vulgar and some of them were racist and it was a huge ordeal. And so like I had to get on the call with engineering, get the pages shut down, like I had to do all these things to try to protect the brand. But that's hands down one of the craziest things that ever happened to me at eBay. And uh, we, were, we were able to prevail. We, we were able to work with the T New York Times to kind of curtail the story. And, you know, they, in, in, in the initial um, article, they actually published that eBay has fixed it and rectified the problem. But, you know, it, 
it's crazy what you learn in, 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 in big companies like that. And that was definitely a big learning experience for me. Jesus, that's an amazing story. So, um, a couple of questions, a couple of follow-up questions on that. So were you the first um, director or the, kind of the first SEO at eBay? No, there's a long lineage of SEO at eBay, right? Um, uh, in fact, the first ever SEO was uh, my well, one of my bosses at eBay. Uh, his name is Robert Chipmwani. He's actually now, he was the CMO at Atlassian. So you, you worked with him at Atlassian. Yes. And, and Robert, <laughs> he has got some crazy stories because this is like the early days, right? This is like the early 2000s. And at the time, eBay did not submit their item pages. So like the actual physical item that you're selling into Google. And the biggest growth in the company's history was submitting hundreds of millions globally to Google and working directly with Google because at that time, crawl was very, very limited. Um, and so that was that was one of his stories. But um, my predecessor actually was Dennis G. So a lot of people probably in the SEO community know Dennis. Uh, he was the director prior, prior to me um, at, at eBay. Gotcha, gotcha. I feel like eBay is such a kind of pattern in my life, right? It's Robert H. Warney and then at Search Metrics, we also <laughs> did some, like a lot of stuff actually for eBay. Yep. Uh, I was, I remember going there for almost a year on site, one week, uh, sorry, one day a week yeah. and working out of eBay. And those folks are amazing. And I met Maxime, got to know him. He's yep. brilliant, yeah. right? So uh, <laughs> really, really cool. Uh, do you have, do you still have ties or connections to the company? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, uh, uh, I still stay really close to, to some folks that are still there. Uh, not so much on, on, on um, uh, you know, the, 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 the SEO team has changed a lot, right? And so there, there's been a lot of new people there, but we're still, you know, really close. I'm still really close to it. And it's, a, it's a really close community, right? Like once you're in the eBay family, like it kind of is something that, you know, uh, kind of spreads and, and it's, it's part of your network uh, after that. So what, what was one, something that you still remember that was a big lesson that you had at, at eBay? Like what is something that you took away from the company, either in terms of managing people, in terms of SEO, uh, in terms of, you know, how to scale a company or a startup in general? Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, let's talk about a couple of things. I think um, one of the greatest opportunities I've had in my career um, is the ability to focus on scale, right? At, at all my SEO jobs, I was... Um, I was in a position where the brands and the entities that, that I was working on SEO needed to find a way to deal with massive scale of SEO, whether it be global or be um, the amount of content that's being published. Uh, th there's a variety, there's a whole list of, of ways that, that you know, the companies that I worked for wanted to scale. And I'd say that that's definitely one of the, the key takeaways and learnings that I got. I mean, I... I know the fundamentals of how to deal with websites that have, you know, hundreds of millions of pages across countries. And that's an experience that you can read about and you can learn about it. But then there's actually going through that. That's totally different. Um, and I'd say that that's one of the, one of the greatest experiences that I, that I had um, in, in multiple places, not just eBay. And then um, on the other side, like one of the greatest uh opportunities I had at eBay was was managing teams. You know, I had not only SEO, but I also had content. And so at that time I was cutting my teeth in terms of how does content play a role in SEO. And uh, and I'd say that that was really probably one of the most rewarding things. Uh, and it has helped me now in my career at Search Metrics, where obviously I have multiple teams and teams that I've never even had any experience managing things like sales that, I, that I'm now responsible for. Sure. And that's a really valuable learning. You touched on something that I think it's really important which is that good seos are all practitioners right like you can read about something but it's not the same thing as actually dealing with it or doing it so and and that particular learning or lesson that you speak about i think is also really important because it, it changed over time so when I, I remember when i came up your number one goal was to blast as many pages into the google index as possible <laughs> just like multiply as much as you can yep. and now the trend has reversed and you kind of want to have only quality and as little quantity as possible. Yeah. So um, did you kind of change your mind when it came to that? Or do you, or let me, let me rephrase the question. What do you think are people doing wrong nowadays when it comes to dealing with large scale sites? Well, I think that fundamentally, one of the biggest um, challenges that we have, not only in the SEO community, but as, as webmasters and as engineers, agencies that manage websites, is that we don't really understand the meaning of intent. And Google has evolved this definition of intent over the last decade. They are refining what is intent to a large degree beyond a keyword. It's, it's really 
goes into the experience, right? I mean, if you just look at even how the SERP has evolved, you know, there's all those like slideshow things of how the Google SERP has changed over the last decade. It's crazy. And that's all to address intent, right? What is a user really looking for and what does a user really want? And so, you know, scaling to build more and more and more pages was a great tactic years ago. And today it can still be applied in certain industries and categories. But the reality is that the, the most important thing for brands, online brands to do today is evaluate what is the intent and do they still have content that matches that intent? And, 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 and if, if there's content that does not match that intent, why do you still have it published? Right? So cleaning up your house, cleaning up your garage is such an important step today, especially for big, big sites because you t often have dead weight and Google is seeing that that's dead weight on your site and not addressing an intent and then it weighs down the rest of the site. Totally, totally. I couldn't agree more. Uh, intent is so major, and uh, it, it kind of makes me want to touch on ranking factors as well. And so you and I were able to listen to, okay, we have a flight announcement. Let's give it a second. Nope, it's a Denver flight. Oh, it's a Denver flight. <laughs> okay, okay. so flight. we're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so you and I were, were able to listen to Will Reynolds yesterday, yeah. uh, who gave a fantastic presentation at Swivel, and he touched on something that I feel very strongly about, which is learning about niche ranking factors, or more or less how ranking factors have different weightings, weightings depending on the query or the article that they're applied to. Right. So I know that search metrics has pretty much been on the forefront of putting that idea out there. Right. I know, um, you know, and that's where I first heard and learned of it and immediately changed my mind of ranking factors. And so, um, can you talk a little bit about how ranking factors apply nowadays, how, how people should think about them. I know there was a lot sure. of contro uh, controversy about um, ranking factor studies and whether they're, you know, um, valuable or not. Right, like, right. Wh wh where is your head at in when it comes to yeah. that? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I think this is another place where, um, you know, the, specifically the SEO community has done a huge disservice to the marketing world, to the, you know, um, product and engineering and webmaster world um, with this idea of ranking factors, right? Because um, uh, the ranking factors by no means are, are, are law, right? This is not the Ten Commandments. Um, ranking factors are data signals. They are uh, directional assets that help us better understand how Google works. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they should be universally applied to every website, universally applied to every category, or universally applied to an entire craft like SEO. And that's where the first mistake happens, right? Which is that a lot of people have taken ranking factors, regardless of who publishes it, Moz, search metrics, um, you know, independent consultants who've kind of created their own studies. They, we read these things and then we say, oh, this, this is what I must do. And, and that's the biggest mistake. Um, what you need to do is you need to sit down and read it and understand how does this now apply to my business and use business logic to make decisions as to why a ranking factor should be leveraged. I mean, a great example, right? I mean, is AMP a, 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 a ranking factor, right? Well, AMP, it, it depends on the category. I mean, if, if you're a newspaper and you're not, and you're not on AMP, well, you're like five years behind now, right? And so, but, you know, if you're a bank, I'm not exactly sure how AMP applies to your business just yet today. And so uh, the long story on, 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 the, on ranking factors is that um, they're still really valuable, but we need to start learning how to leverage this asset and how to incorporate it back to what Will said at, 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 at Swivel. How do we incorporate this into the value period, pyramid? Like, is this at the bottom of the pyramid and it's just an anecdotal data point? Or is this something at the top of the pyramid that's going to help me generate revenue for my business? Totally agree. There's so much context that is lost in this discussion about ranking factors. I very much agree with you. We first of all have to distinguish between a ranking enabler and then a ranking driver, right? Like what even allows me to rank and user intent is something like that. I also wouldn't say that user intent is necessarily a ranking factor, right? right? But if it's, it's very binary after my mind. You either hit it or you don't, right? You meet it or you don't. Um, especially when the user intent is very clear for a keyword uh, or when it's clear to Google for a keyword. And then the second thing is that people judge and did or did judge ranking factor studies with such a weird attitude um, and like saying, yeah, causality is not correlation. Like the things that 
the the number of things in life that actually have a strong proven causality are so small. <laughs> right. Like, right. If you like, I'm the thing is, I'm a, I'm a huge fitness nerd. I read tons of studies, and that's where I learned how like what makes a good study and when you can somewhat reliably say something based on the proof that you have. Right. So I think by I think. Um, Research in uh, in medical and biology and fitness and all that kind of stuff is really actually a really good place to learn uh, from and understand how statistics works and uh, you know how to how to interpret results and so um, again like I feel like people completely um, like com- completely put ranking factor studies aside even though I think there is something valuable to learn out of them and right. I completely agree like we should learn we have to learn how to apply them correctly so how do you recommend people to take ranking factor studies or how to think of ranking factors in general? Yeah. So the first thing is, how are you going to use this asset, right? Uh, I think one of the greatest ways to leverage ranking factors or any any data study that you do is how how can this be applied into either the thought leadership that we have in our company? How can this be used by our organization to better understand how different mechanics work in search or, or in business? And the reality is that um, that's kind of like the first step, right? Because if you're educating everyone to be on the same playing field, when it comes to say implementing, say a ticket or making a major change on your website or, or, um, you know, uh, you know re, re, retitling, you know, your pages and or writing better product descriptions or whatever it is, uh, you now have all a common understanding of what's the driver. And that's what ranking factors do, right? Is they give you a base knowledge of like what's going to drive success for, for a website in Google. And um, I think that that's the first step, right? First, first step for a brand to really use ranking factors is how am I going to apply this from, from an education standpoint, from a thought leadership standpoint in the organization? The second thing is, is can this ranking factor actually be implemented into my value pyramid? Can I, can I incorporate this as a data point that now I use in my BI tools? Like, should I have the correlation that then maps to my ranking data and my BI tool or my traffic data and my BI tool? That's a very like basic everyday thing that, that, that your analytics team and your business should be doing. Or does this move way up my value chain and determine a strategic decision like say how we're going to create product descriptions and that drive more revenue in my business, right? So there's, there's, there's a whole chain that you can you can incorporate these ranking factors into your business. Um, the, the hard part is that most people are just taking them as doctrine and saying, I'm going to put this into my, in my business. I'm just going to, I'm going to start writing descriptions at 350 words, every single description. Cause that's what the ranking factor told me. That makes no sense. If you're not applying that to the value period pyramid and saying, I want to, I want to try to make more revenue. So I'm going to improve my, my descriptions. It's a totally different viewpoint. 100%. I, I wrote about this on a drift blog, actually as a, as a guest blog, um, that's, you cannot apply the same, SEO approaches and strategies to, you know, to all businesses. Like you have to absolutely be specific to, first of all, you're marketing to consumers or to businesses. Um, what vertical are you in, right? Like what is important? And I, I really love how in some of the search metrics material, you guys point out uh, how, for example, HTTPS is really important for your money or life sites and finance medical, for example. Um, but then images are really important for, um, travel or for fashion and beauty and all that kind of stuff. And it, the, the funny thing is it intuitively makes sense. And I love that you guys kind of put some data points behind it to justify it. But I completely agree. You can't just really... And I made this mistake in the past and I painfully learned that. <laughs> you just can't run, like walk into an organization and be like, look, these are the ranking factors. This is what we do. No, I think that's completely the wrong approach, right? Exactly, exactly. So what is what is the future hold for um, ranking factor research at search metrics? Are you guys going to do more studies? Are you going to come out with more material? Will you lay that to rest because of the the kind of negative resonance in the in the industry? Like, what's the plan? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that we've gone down is uh, about a year ago, we went down the niche path. So so putting, putting out data in the niche path. Another thing that we're now getting even more granular into is providing data at a market level. So for a a lot of businesses understanding their own market data so understanding how footwear is evolving in search is so critical and it's and it's a component of understanding your ranking factors and so what we've started to do is say from going from these high level overall general ranking factors like we used to do you know six seven eight years ago down to a niche level like let's talk about ranking factors for e-commerce 
And now we're getting down to the actual category level. And that, that I think is where, where there's tons of value for, for, for the end consumer in having a, a market level analysis, because now you can truly understand what factors drive your category, what factors drive your competitors, your own business. And it becomes very relatable to your, your, your industry, as opposed to like something that's general for all of e-commerce, because Wayfair certainly has a very different strategy than say Amazon does than say eBay does. But now if I can take that and create data that's specific to just Wayfair, completely changes the picture. Cool. I love that. So um, let's dive into that. So, so that's a, if you, if you want. Yeah, to. sure. So does that mean that you will look at ranking factors for a specific category within e-commerce? So for example, you'll look at, um, gosh, like books, for example, or um, got to make something up, man, like uh, cars or whatever. Yeah. Is that how to understand it? Absolutely. And one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to take it from a very concrete taxonomy. So like one of the things that we've started experiment with is let's take a look at Google's own PLA taxonomy. So they have this taxonomy, they publish it, they, they use it as a, as a way for you to leverage PLA ads. So let's take that taxonomy and let's apply all of the keywords in our database to that taxonomy. It completely changes your entire view because once you apply the keywords to that, just like, I mean, as you know, Kevin, in our database, now I can apply all the URLs that are in there. And now I can really start to understand what kind of content is driving these categories and subcategories. And this is a very simplistic view of just PLA, but we can take that for a specific business and we can say, hey, um, you know, let's sit down with, um, with you, Wayfair, and let's talk about sofas. What's going on in the sofa category? Because that's really important to you. And now we're connecting SEO concepts and data to specific business problems and opportunities. And to the real world, right? Like that's where, that's, that's so smart, right? Because to me, the, the way that I understand this is that like we think about what Google is chasing. They're obviously chasing a perfect reflection of the real world and, and problems that people have, right? And so I love that you guys take this approach because there's obviously a different challenge behind ordering a sofa online than like compared to of, of ordering like a small lamp online, right? right? Like logistics-wise, right. price-wise, feature-wise, right? And so that makes so much more sense. And I'm curious to see what kind of how Google will approach that. So have you have you looked at the data? Do you have any any kind of interesting lessons that you can share so far? Yeah. So I mean, some of the more remarkable data that that we've looked at is, um, you know, uh, to, to to your point is how do you slice something like travel? Right. You look at travel as a whole. Right. There's a lot of different de desires and needs in travel, and so being able to to carve out and not just say universally this is what you need to do in travel, but this is exactly what you need to do when you're focused on lodging, versus say airfare versus say events, and that these are the these are the 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 KPIs behind that or the ranking factors say based on what kind of media assets are on the pages, what kind of description is being used, how many images are being shown, or how many results or options should you have, and this is amazing data because. If I'm, say, like the wind, right, big resort in Las Vegas, right, um, I can control certain elements on my product page to compete with the OTAs, OTAs being online travel agencies, right? So if I'm the win and I want to be able to compete with an OTA who's showing a diverse set of results, right? They're showing not only the win, but they're also showing the Venetian and they're showing Aria and they're showing the Cosmopolitan, all the hotels along the strip, right? But I, as the win, can compete against them but I need data to know what to do to compete. And one of them is selection. And the win has selection, right? They own the Encore, so you can also show Encore options on certain pages. You also have various different types of rooms. You have suites, you have the regular rooms. And so now you can create a much more inclusive product page that can rank for more keywords and take market share away from the OTAs. And if I'm the win, that, me that means lots of money because now I don't have to pay a fee to a third party. That is so cool. And it makes, oh my gosh, th there are so many routes that I would want to take this conversation down to. And so I'm really thinking about which one is the, the most intriguing. Before they board our flight and take off. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know. It's like I'm waiting for this to happen any second to, <laughs> to announce that we're going to miss this. Um, <clears throat> no, anyway. Um, okay. One last question and then we'll, yeah, we'll, take, sure. uh, we'll take the last bigger block. So um, one thing that I noticed is that the lines between 
businesses who are competing against each other in the search results is kind of is is very much blurring. And what that means is we, for example, at G2, we're competing with other software review sites like Captera, obviously, or you know, like uh, Gartner. Sure. Um, but we're also com uh, competing with uh, publishers like um, Tech Target or Software Advice, Advice, and we're also competing with certain brands like Salesforce or uh, Marketo, right? And so we have different types of competitors, and I think that's increasing because Google is, in some cases, trying to address different user intents. Um, and so that idea of you mentioning a hotel kind of stepping over its boundaries and providing more interesting data will probably also make more businesses or types of businesses compete with each other. Right. What, is, what are your thoughts there? Did you notice anything in the data or observe anything along, you know, uh, um, along your work at Search Metrics? Yeah, let's talk about my opinion on this and yeah, then let's yeah, talk yeah. about the data because there's two components to this. The first one is my opinion around why this is good. I think Google loves this. I think Google demands this because it creates diversity. It creates... And, and, and Google knows that if their search results are more diverse and have some cross-category influence, they're going to be more successful as a company, right? Because us as consumers, we want options. There's a reason why, you know, you see all those studies about um, the number of clicks that take place in the organic results, and it, it'll range anywhere between 70 to like 90%, right? But there's a reason why people click on organic results versus the paid ads, because in paid ads, you do not have diversity. It's only a, con a confined set of competitors who are willing to spend money, and it really shrinks the window of diversity. But when you have the organic results, there's a tremendous amount of diversity. And I'll give you a great example of where, now going into the data, of where this diversity takes place. Um, TripAdvisor, for the last year and a half to maybe two years now, has been moving cross-category, right? So one of the things that we've noticed in our data is that TripAdvisor, for the last two to three years, has increased their footprint into the restaurant space. Now, who do you think ranks in restaurants, right? In the U.S. in particular, it's mainly Yelp, right? And then you have a variety of other local service type websites that rank but this is great for Google because Google for a long time has struggled to provide good results at a restaurant level. How do I create diversity when someone searches for an Italian restaurant in, say, North Beach, San Francisco or Italian restaurant in New York City? How do I create good diversity? Now they've got a new brand that they trust who has restaurant data, putting it in an aggregated way into the SERPs and... Google's showing a lot of TripAdvisor content. Now, this is a great example of companies moving cross-category, gaining awareness. Now, I do believe that there's a limit to these things. And to our point earlier, when we first started the, the, the episode here, um, we talked about um, having too many pages, right? And I think that a lot of companies, when they cross-category, because they're new to the category, they don't know the limitations, right? They don't know the boundaries. And I'm sure that a lot of people who've been studying search for a long time know that Yelp in the past has had a major issue with what we call stacked results, right? So you go, you do a search and you see like four pages for Yelp in the top listings. And, you know, Yelp over time, or Google, a combination probably of both, has cleaned that experience up. And I, I believe that um, oftentimes when, when brands move into a new category, what they, what they forget is knowing where the boundaries are and testing the boundaries. There are only so many cities in the United States and there are only so many city and food combinations that Google is really only going to be willing to serve content for because they already have the data from the other side, which is this is what users want. Right, right. That is, I, I promise you we're going to, Go to the next question, but there's one thing that, I, that <laughs> that's just I, I'm going to be selfish. Our plane has here. not arrived, so we got time. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see if it arrives if at it all. Shows up, right? We might be walking back. It's already four hours late, so let's see if we got to drive from Bend <laughs> to San Francisco. Um, okay, so that makes perfect sense for me, and I'm 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 really learning right now. So thanks for that. That like my mind is blown right now at this <laughs> point. So does that mean that me as if I was trip advisor and have different verticals and different ranking factors applied to those verticals that I need to take a different completely different approach to my categories? Yes. Jesus. Exactly. And you have to and this is why and, and, and but this this holds true for for um all types of businesses, right? And and if you think about it, even even like let's take 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 one of the oldest, you know, organized businesses that 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 have, has existed in like the last 200 years 
um, you know, publishing, right? Let's take the publishing role, right? How does a publisher, like a newspaper, organize themselves, right? They've got a chief editor, and then they've got all these editors that go across category, and then they've got all these, you know, supporting editors that take subcategories, and then they've got field people who are researching and getting all the articles, and that all kind of comes together, right? And the same applies to to our online businesses, right? And and you need somebody who has a sharp eye and understands the online restaurant world to make decisions about where and how you're going to publish content, not just to Google, but to users. Oftentimes, we overlook that. We overlook the value of that experience and that knowledge. And we just say, hey, let the machine do what it wants. And that's where we get in trouble, right? I mean, uh, you know, I'll give you a great, real quick example. I mean, we, I mean, we, we used to work with this car company and, and, and I sat down with the CEO and I showed him that, um, you know, they, they published a page for Bentleys in Des Moines, Iowa. Now, uh, Bentley, uh, a Bentley is not, there are no Bentleys for sale in Des Moines. Let's just start with that, okay? Um, there hasn't been a Bentley sold in Des Moines ever on this website. And... The closest Bentley dealership is 502 miles away. So you tell me how much value that page is creating for consumers in, in, in Des Moines. N- none. Zero. And Google already knows that. Wow. That is absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, when are you guys, when are you going to uh, release the next kind of iteration of Ranking Factor Studies? Well, we're working on this product right now. It's called, we call it Market Insights internally. And so, um, but it's unique, right? So it's, it's a totally different twist on, on Ranking Factors because it's not something that is just something that we publish the market. It requires the market to come to us. It requires, you know, people like you to come to us and say, hey, this is what I have for G2. I have these very specific business units can you help me understand this? And so it's a very different approach. It's not um, um, it's not the same as as, as our previous um, studies. Um, and so I think that uh, the, the the first thing is that you know I encourage anyone to, to to reach out to us if you want to like try to get a sliver of this data. We're happy to share some of this data. Where can people reach out? Yeah, we you can reach out either on the Search Metrics website. Um, we have a Market Insights section on our website, or you can you can reach out directly to me on on LinkedIn, Twitter, or you can email me Jordan at Search Metrics. I'm happy to I'm happy to follow up and provide um, uh, insights at at this level. Uh, the other the other thing is we will be publishing glimpses of these studies, right? Because as we do more of these we're going to have very specific and concrete data and we'll be able to share that as a, as a kind of more of a use case than a, than a, than a report like we used to do. And I think that's where the industry is going to get all the value. Man. Amazing. I'm really looking forward to that. It's, it means like the next step of understanding SEO and how it evolves, understanding Google. So I'm pumped about that. Um, I know you are pumped about, you know, or have a strong opinion on politics and how, you know, we can have a stance in that. So, so where's your mind at in those regards yeah it's, it's a total curveball here totally, right like, total you know, curveball. This is the point of this show like there's no <laughs> so if you've made it to... this far in this episode then then <laughs> you know kudos to you you've dealt with airport background noise and uh you know our delayed flight here but anyway um to this politics topic so you know we're coming up on another election next year right and 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 it's not just about the election it's really about the the current political environment uh, from the lens of technology, right? So technology is maturing now, right? I mean, a lot of these businesses, Google, Facebook, many others, um, they're, they're over 20 years old, right? And, and so there's a level of responsibility that they now have in society. And um, what we're starting to see is that a lot of legislators, um, our, 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 our legislators here in this country are, are trying to understand and learn how to better regulate Many of these businesses, whether it's the Cambridge Analytica scandal or or issues that we've had with uh, privacy with 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 Google, um, the reality is that that our our government is starting to take a step towards regulation. Right, Europe has done a big big step in the direction of GDPR. Um, uh, California will have, I think, next year uh, implement the California Privacy Act, and so there there are already there's already legislation that's moving that direction. But here is what I want to share, here's what I want people to recognize is we're at a pivotal point where big tech, Facebook, Google's of the world, Twitter's of the world, are directly influencing the direction of these legislation, of this legislation. They are investing millions upon millions of dollars in lobbyists and lawyers who sit in Washington, D.C. to inform 
our elected politicians on how to form this legislation. And what I want to encourage everyone in this country to do, so if you're a U.S. citizen, which you are. I am. Yeah, I just I wanted, I, even though you're from, you, you are. <laughs> so, no excuse. Yeah, exactly. You have no excuse here, Kevin. Um, is to take a stance and write to our our elected officials. These people are representing us as people. They are not representing Facebook. They are not representing Google. And we need to be informing and educating our legislators, our elected officials, on how to view the world of search, the world of social, the world of paid ad, digital advertising. And I ultimately want, want to encourage everyone. I mean, I, I've done it. I, I, I wrote just recently to um, the California Attorney General. Um, I, I found a website that I felt was um, uh, had malicious practices. And um, they sent me a two-page letter. Specific, wow. I'm not kidding. A specific two-page letter to my responding to my, my, my concerns. And I think that that's amazing. That that's the dialogue we need to have because by me informing them of what I considered uh, a malicious practice online, they now are aware. They are now learning. And now when they are, you know, um, you know, running for office, making decisions, pushing their own legislation, they're they're taking that into account. And so we as individuals need to become more vocal about how we want to see the technology world change, how we want to see the search change, search world change, how we want to see the digital advertising world change because these regulations are coming, but are they coming for the people or are they coming to increase the pockets of big tech? Yeah, you're absolutely on point. And uh, by the way, I'll put all the links and references that we mentioned here in the show into the show notes. Obviously, the PLA uh, taxonomy, um, how to um, reach out to your um, representative, uh, depending on which state. I'll have to think about how I best do that. But they, I'm sure they do have an aggregated. There's a there's a couple websites that show a full list for every single state, and then how you can contact your congressman or your your senator. So yeah, that, it's, it exists. I'll, I'll definitely add that to the show notes. Um, and it's it's a good point. It's a good timing that she mentioned this because as, okay. That's us. <laughs> that's our flight. Wow, I think that's a calling. Yeah. Okay, I think we should slowly uh, start to get going. Uh, Jordan, first well, there, of all. There's clapping for this flight. It's that delayed. <laughs> it's <laughs> that delayed. <laughs> people are relieved. Yeah, exactly. um, people, first of all, where can people find you? They can find me on Twitter, JT Cooney, my last name, K-O-E-N-E. -E. They can find me on LinkedIn, and I'm happy to connect and communicate in, through either channel. Awesome. Is there any last words that you want to get out before we board this plane? No, I just want to say, hey, thanks. Thanks for this opportunity, Kevin. I think this was great. By the way, he was an amazing speaker at the Swivel Conference. So uh, I know we talked a lot about Will's stuff, but but a lot of our conversation was influenced through your, your stuff too. Jordan, I have to thank you. Thanks for doing this uh, impromptu, and thanks for enlightening us with, with your vis wisdom. Uh, I learned so much just out of that conversation. So whatever happens, I thank you very, very much. I Absolutely, Kevin. It. Anytime. Thank you. Awesome.